Hey, this is John Bokenkamp, writer of episode 814, Misère, which I can't say without a French accent, Misère. You are listening to The Blacklist Expose on Golden Spiral Media. And the card game concepts continue this week. Welcome to the award-winning The Blacklist Exposed podcast. Greetings, one and all. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. If we're playing cards, everybody knows, Troy, you're the dum-dum. It's, it's true. Fact. It's Especially true. long-time fans. Thanks for joining us yet again as we talk about no number episode on The Blacklist. Misere. 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 Written by John Bokercamp, who... F- fantastic opening. Hey, good job. <laughs> Bravo, I laughed hard. Bravo, sir. I laughed hard. And John Eisendrath, and directed by Christine Gee. So don't send that intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed. can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. Glad you are here. We are cruising right along in Season 8 with this recap episode. So if you haven't caught up with The Blacklist, you can just watch this one and skip the rest of the season so you can watch the end and then go back and rewatch the beginning when it comes <laughs> out on true. Netflix. It's true. Uh Basically, we go through the crux of the episode for you after we do a little house cleaning from last week where we answer a fan feedback poll. Then we get into your thoughts about whatever you want to talk about in our special agent intel section at the end of the show. No Reds rhetoric this week, obviously, because it was mostly Liz for all of it. Well, no, we can have it this week. It was just on last week's episode. Oh, that's true. That's true. We'll, just re- we'll just replay it. I got you. <laughs> we can like call a it a clip show. Clip show. <laughs> yeah. Recap clip show somewhere in there. I don't. I don't know. I gotta say, for for a show where I saw pretty much everything already, I was entertained. I mean, we've we jest being podcasters about like, oh, it's the clip show. Oh, <laughs> it's the recap episode of the season because they needed to buy some time for the recording to catch up for the filming and all that fun stuff, which may be true because they did film this one in tandem with last week's episode. But for a clip recap show. This was fairly well done. I have to say there was enough new stuff that it didn't feel like a clip show, even though it really was. You keep saying clip show. I I say it's a recap. show. It's basically just showing the flip side. It's showing all of the Liz's actual plans. And, you know, we've been speculating for the whole freaking season about, I don't know. Did Liz mean to do this? She mean to do that. She mean for that to happen. Was that part of the plan? And now we know the answer to all those questions. But we had, yes. clips, but we had <laughs> clips from other parts of the blacklist as well. Cause Mr. Yeah, Solomon but there was very, back. very few clips. You keep calling it a clip show. There's like a handful of actual clips. The rest of it was all newly shot. And it was just the flip side of the same situation. So I call it a recap show because we're recapping the events. But it's still new material, mostly. Mostly. The clip show is when you had like five minutes of Dan Fielding and then, you know, reliving all the past episodes of Night Court that he went through. I don't know why Night Court came up, but that's the best show that ever made me laugh on television. So that's Well, it was why. three minutes of reliving Rudiger's shootout scene. So it's close to five minutes. I don't know. You, you keep wanting to sell this whole clip thing, but, you know, you do you. Whatever, whatever you want to define it as. I enjoyed it even though I knew everything that was part of it because it was basically just catching us up to speed on Liz's But I liked the whole psychosis fractured psyche thing. That was kind of a nice spin. And we did get something new this week, but you'll have to wait to hear about what that was until we get through our profiling question from last week where we made you basically put a stake in the ground and say, once and for all, are you team red or team Liz? And I don't think we are surprised by the results. I was. I was shocked. I was I was stunned. I was taken aback. 86% of you said Team Liz. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm dyslexic. Oh, yeah. 80, 86% of you said Team Red. Sorry. That makes more sense. Oh, okay. You're just reading the wrong line. I got you. Dyslexic. That's what it is. That's what I literally just said. Oh. But you would know that if you would listen. I couldn't 14% hear, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> said Team Liz. Uh, I'm with the 14%. Team Liz all the way. I know it's the minority, but I'm pulling for the underdog. Kill him. I so, am. So many people hate this podcast every time I speak. <laughs> I, sad thing is, I'm actually with you after this week's episode. Uh, it, what? It was definitely. Hold that thought. I don't want to don't yeah, spoil it. I mean, I, I was on Liz's side through the whole thing. That's so smart teaming up with Townsend still. We'll talk about that. But after this week's episode, I think I'm Team Liz. I guess it's 15% now, people. Well, the question for next week 
who's really to blame for what happened to Anne? I know everybody's going to be like, Liz, you got Anne Hurts. Um, does Red have no culpability here? Did people not kind of advise him to not see Anne? Did Liz not ask him, please tell me stuff so I don't have to have this hanging over my head and lose my mind and everything else? Please don't kill my mom or who I think is my mom or might be my mom or whatever. Is Red not a little culpable? So that's the question. Who's really to blame for what happened to Anne? The only person we know is not responsible is freaking Anne. Okay. Right. It's not her fault. For sure. But does this get into the same concept we were talking about with Liz and the Cyranoid and who's responsible for killing Mary Bremer? Well, now we know that one. <laughs> <laughs> Liz is a straight up murderer. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You can't be an agent again. I don't want you working for the FBI. That does not seem to be a good, a good fit at this point. Sure does not. But before we start having haunting dreams of our own, why don't we go ahead and get into this week's case profile? A Mazir game is one played according to its conventional rules, except that it is played to lose. That is, the winner is the one who loses according to the normal game rules. Or if the game is for more than two players, the one who wins according to the normal rules loses. I've never been more confused in my entire life. It makes sense if you stop thinking about it. Oh, so basically what you're saying is, is that if I'm playing cards and I literally cannot win a single hand... I call misere, and I basically play to not take a single trick. No, but cool. Uh, I I think (laughs) the the allusion to the title in the show, uh, the way that you can see it play out is since Liz learns that she has to play by Red's rules or she'll suffer the same fate as Kaplan. If you play by normal rules, you're going to lose. You got, you need to raise the stakes. You need to, you need to bring something. I thought it was the actually the opposite of that. In it's the a sense. game played to lose. You're playing to lose it. Like you, you're playing to lose the game. But she's so she wins if she loses. Though that's the idea of the misere, right? The winner is the one who loses according to the normal game rules. But did she actually win in this case because she had him dead to rights in the back of the head with a gun, and then she fled the scene? So by she, playing his rules, does she end up the winner no, because she lost? She's, She played by her, she changed, remember, she played her, at the end of the episode, she's basically saying, I don't have to play this way, but she has him dead to rights right there, according to all the rules, and she plays a different way, so she loses. She could have killed him right there. That's the way I understand it. Of course, I think I confused myself just saying that, so I don't even know if I started with the right explanation before I was already confused about what I was trying to explain. Basically, it's a cool French word, and we'll say it a couple times more this episode. Yeah. It, and it rhymes with brazier. So I like that. <laughs> that is <laughs> so weird. <laughs> so weird. I'm just trying to dig out of this hole because I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> I think All you're right, yourself into a deeper characters. one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. New music this week starts as Fa 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 from Data Rock Plays as the backtrack for the plan explanation between Liz, Skip, and Essie. There's That's also fun. what sounds like a haunting Russian lullaby when we see Kaplan again for the first time in a while and then it replays later in the episode so if anybody knows that russian lullaby please send it our way we also get to recap or relive our songs from last week with how low by jose gonzalez as we have the police station scene once again and then the chat between kaplan and liz in the car or is it really a chat between liz and liz because kaplan's really not there hmm uh then the angel of warning plays again by merrily rush as red returns to the house for the final showdown with Elizabeth or not. It's not really final. He is lives it? another left. day. <laughs> you can hear all these great songs over on the playlists. We have links to them both for Apple music and Spotify on our website, the blacklist Now overall, what did you think of the episode? Mazir? I know we made fun of the whole clip recap thing, but as a whole, what did you think of the I episode? I thought it was really fantastic. Actually, I was Super hyped, actually, for this week's episode, even though I think we pretty much called every turn last week of how this was going to go down. We did. Um, So even (laughs) though... Except I was wrong. I said the gun was pointing at Red, that Liz wasn't pointing the gun at Anne, and she actually was pointing the gun at Anne. So... I think, though, in the clip, in the the picture we saw last week, though, that's when she was pointing it at Red. So you would be That's true, because the gun was pointed outward. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. I guess Um, I'm right. 
initially she was pointing it at Anne, but the one we saw last week would be pointing it at Red. Makes sense. Um, but overall, I'm still wrong because my my mind she wouldn't have pointed at Anne, and I was wrong because Liz is really taking some steps in this episode. She sure is. She sure is. So I would say that even though we pretty much called it, we knew it was a recap clip show. I'm still 100% thoroughly entertained the entire 42 minutes. I don't think there was a single time where I was like, oh, I'm bored. Why is this? Why is this here? Why is this playing? I love how they worked in like the car. Like you saw the car sitting up there on the hill. They worked everything in during the, um, uh, the Rudiger scene, right? So it's like, so just to see the other side of the coin, I thought was really, really neat that they actually leveraged it like the, uh, the getaway scene in the, um, water department van and how Liz was the one that was the getaway driver. I thought that was really cool and how they just kind of weave that all together. It was very well crafted episode of television. I have to say, I, I really liked how they kind of addressed everything and all those secret times when you think that was Liz there. Well, now she's back in the episode and I'm glad that we don't have to hear the fan stuff about well, where's Megan. You don't have to hear that anymore. I'm <laughs> That's nice. A nice relief. She's back in the show. I was very happy to see her back. I really, really enjoyed it. Probably almost as much as last week's. Um, even though it was a lot of, I'll be honest, I've missed her in the show. So, you know, Team Liz, like I said. Okay, so let me ask you this question because it's just popped mm-hmm. into my head. You said specifically that you were tired of all these episodes that were about Liz but Liz wasn't present. Megan wasn't present. Correct. Now that you know that Megan technically was present the entire time. Does Liz, it make, Liz was pregnant. Yeah, Liz was present. Does it make you... Present. Did I say pregnant? Please, dear God. Don't, I did not say <laughs> anything say to emails. do with her personal life. Please, dear life. God, don't say it emails. Her personal life is her business. I have no idea what she was doing right. in the meantime. No, she was not. Um, she was present in the episodes. Now that you see from her point of view, does mm-hmm. that change your mind of the original episodes from earlier in the season? No, it, it still made the episodes less enjoyable to me personally. I mean, it, it doesn't change the enjoyment factor. It, it, does it give it a little bit more heft if you go back and rewatch them? Sure. I, I just, I feel like whenever, if you have a main character that's gone for a period of time and then you still have episodes basically centered around them and they're not there, it it's distracting. And it was more of a distraction. It didn't necessarily mean that all the episodes weren't good or didn't have merit or weren't didn't have moments it just was a distraction it took me out of the episodes i don't want to be taken out of the episodes i want to enjoy them and it's hard for me to be immersed if i know that a character isn't really there and but they're constantly talking about i would would have rather i just had blacklisters for like eight episodes or whatever the number is that she's been gone would those episodes have been better had these quote-unquote clips been woven into those episodes and you yes. just saw Megan the whole time. Yep. Yep. Wouldn't have been a distraction. It probably didn't help that online, you know, and fans were making such a big deal about it. So I couldn't escape it. You know what I mean? Cause you, you know me, I don't like that kind of, I don't like, I don't care about actors, personal lives. Not that I don't care. I just, it's not my business. And I firmly believe that, but there's a lot of people that seem to think that they're entitled to know what's going on. And I just don't feel that way. So to me, it's, like vitriol on the internet, and then it's like a distraction because of that. It's probably a twofold. It's probably the online reaction to some of that, and then it's the trying to watch it, and it's still bam right there. I, I just want to watch the episode. I just want to enjoy the show. I don't want to have to think about it. I guess. Well, that was a great softball question, Aaron, or softball tee up. Because if you just want to enjoy the episode, there's probably some things that you just don't want to know about ahead of time. And I'm curious as to your feelings on our good friends over at the NBC promo department who teased Kaplan's voice at the end of last week and then oh, literally man. threw a clip out to the world that showed Kaplan in the episode. And how did you feel about getting that information ahead of tonight's episode? I mean, if NBC had lips, I would tell them to kiss my ass because <laughs> because I was pissed. I was so Pissed. I told Troy how pissed I was. I hope it doesn't. I hope I don't get sued or something. I don't know if it's slander or what. But my God, stop telling me everything in the ads, man. Like I would have had no because I do a very good job of avoiding any kind of spoilers. But then NBC put 
put out a presser and it's a picture of Megan and Camplin and it's like, or I'm sorry, Liz and Camplin. And I'm just like, ah, I had no idea. I didn't know that was going to be there. That would have been such a fantastic surprise because you know, I love that character and you can tell by the picture. I, you and I both talked about it before we ever got there. It was a dream sequence or it was in her head. So we knew that it wasn't going to be, cause I, I just, those writers aren't going to backtrack that death that, that takes away all the stakes. So I, they're not going to backtrack it. But, it then the was, fa- but, but then the fans are like for three days, like, Oh my God, she's alive. She's, she survived. See, I told you. And it's like, Oh, the noise that it just creates. It distracts from the promotion yeah. value of the episode. Really? Yeah. And, and it's just sad. I mean, I, I purposely made sure that I, I couldn't be tagged in, in many, <laughs> many things for a reason because people were always tagging me in spoilers. So I go to great lengths to not be spoiled on stuff. And that, and that's my personal choice. You know, some people are like, it's not a spoiler if NBC puts it out. Sure it is. <laughs> I didn't know it. The episode hasn't aired. It's a spoiler. I firmly believe that. So I blame the advertising department or whoever pushed that out. I mean, I get that they're trying to sell the show though, and that'll probably bring people back and that gets them excited. And, you know, I know ratings have have taken a toll coincidentally when Liz was gone, but the, you know, some of those things are a factor. Just don't, I don't want it to be spoiled. And you know, I was, I was pissed. I hate when I'm spoiled. I can't stand it. Troy on un, you know, unintentionally spoils stuff all the time. Sometimes I just don't talk to him till the episode airs. <laughs> Some freaks gonna tell me something that he's figured out. I just like for, to enjoy. For things. the record, I don't spoil it. I just say enough words that because Aaron is super smart, he figures it out. So he spoils himself. Technically, we wa- we both watch too much TV. We That's do. what I'm saying. That's we sure. both should read books more. That we should. That we should. Except I fall yeah. asleep at page two. <laughs> but on the same token, knowing that she was there. It didn't d- deter, which I am a big fan of. I'm a big fan of if there's a surprise guest, you should be able to enjoy the episode like on a repeat and it's still enjoyable and it's because it's no longer a surprise. You know what I mean? And it very much was like, I was not deterred by that. It was still very, it was great to have Gamblin back. I thought it was a very intelligent way to do it. I kind of really loved how they made it a little bit of a mental break for Liz Right. Because there's, she's literally having conversations by herself. And at one point, what at the end where she's like, you see her too. And it's like, wow, she's full blown. <laughs> I love that. I think that's great. She's I love been, she's that. been rocking in a chair trying to figure out her life for the last couple of months. And it's like, all right, she's fully snapped. Oh, and yeah, then Red's like, like Norman Bates. Red's like, yeah, Kaplan's never left me my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> like God, Red's like on drugs or something too. Must, like be, it. must be the illness getting to his brain. I really love that. I thought that was a great tweak because I thought it was just going to be one dream sequence, not in the whole episode. That was that was cool. Would have been even better if I didn't know about it, but hey, what are you going to do? Now, do you think that this this might be a good question? Do you think that if Kaplan was alive, she would be advising Liz the exact same way? Or do you think this was Liz really more convincing herself and just giving a figment to the words that she was trying to wrestle with, but this isn't really what Kaplan would have wanted. Oh, this is a very much a representation of her conscience. I, I think her willpower, you know, that voice in your head, it's a representation of the voice in your head. Um, and, and Kaplan is the, the voice that she needs. You know, she needs that voice pushing her forward, telling her what she has to do because she doesn't want to like the Liz we know is still there she still doesn't want to hurt people, um, but she also needs to get this done. Like she needs to get some closure for herself. And in her mind, like people keep saying they hate her because you don't know this. You don't know that. In her mind, she watched the dude who's basically been torturing her for eight years, kill her mother. Like the only good thing that she had in her life, you know, because everybody knows Red cares about her and everything else. But I'll say it a thousand times. Actions matter. His actions are selfish. They aren't. They aren't that of someone who just cares about her because he would just end her suffering and tell her what she needed to know if that were the case. So she's in a different mind space, and he's doing all these little talks. I never wanted you to be here. Well, then stop doing this stuff. Like it seems like a really simple solution <laughs> to me, to every, to Dembe, to everybody, except Red. So 
you know, I you reap what you sow. This is on him, as far as I'm concerned. I said it. So then the end of the episode happens. Anne gets her head knocked on the table, and Liz magically disappears. Mm-hmm. So we all know that Liz actually pushed Liz- Anne into the table when they were wrestling. It's yeah, not like I it- mean, Anne kind of thought she was Chuck Norris for a minute. That just relax. You sure. don't need to d- make that move. You're not a ninja. The, the the point I'm trying to make though is that the way it was shot for that last scene, there could be the conspiracy theorist fans out there that said. Oh, this really didn't happen, and it was all in Liz's dream the entire time. I don't think so because she just kind of like very- she just kind of disappears at the last minute there without really walking out the door, and the door is actually in front of Red. If you remember the positioning of the house, no, that shot was to say that she walked away from murdering him. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's what that was. I I think you're reaching because you you like that. You like to encourage that kind of off the wall thinking i will I, encourage it all day long because it's fun but i will tell you that that's exactly what it was, was liz escaped yeah she walked away it, it, it wasn't just escape it was walked away and she, she walked away um, because she saw the red that she yeah, loved i don't think it had anything to do season with that. six nope don't think it had anything to do with it i think she didn't want to be that person so you think her decision to walk away was specifically about her yep. and her choice Yep. Not the fact that she's seeing this man care for another person and she's never seen him care for another person except her and his entire and her entire existence with him. I I mean except for Dembe. It. She's seen it a little bit. I I I think it was she saw what happened, you know, Red leads to these things all the time. A lot of this stuff is his own fault because he won't I mean he's he, he's he won't share. vicious. He won't change. He's the worst kindergartner ever. I think she sees that what the the hurt that her actions just brought like this woman not not to say that red isn't culpable in the situation but she saw this woman get hurt this innocent woman Anne's a great woman she knows that she met her sydney knows her now you know baked her a cake yeah Yeah. (laughs) hit her car baked her a cake like you do and and apparently they know each other well enough to know that she has a cabin that she can escape to but that was that was interesting um but yeah she she just saw the ramifications of her actions and she doesn't want to be that person. She doesn't want to be red. She just wants to get red. She wants to make red pay for what he did and she couldn't do it. There's a couple of times in the episode where she couldn't do it. You know, she couldn't go that final step to take him out. She did. There is space for her between what she wants and what she's willing to do to get it. All right. Okay. You want to talk about some character stuff? Let's go ahead and do it. Um, we're just, we'll just zip through a few of them because really it's all about Liz and Liz and that little monkey on her back. Uh, Liz talks to Dembe's daughter and talks her into planting a wire. That's probably the biggest long shot for me. How about you? Yeah, like I haven't seen you in forever and all of a sudden you're just calling out of the blue when all this stuff is going down and then you're going to come up and be like, hi, dad, how are you? <laughs> you think Dembe would be a little bit smarter on that one, especially after getting torched at Tortured by uh, Lake and Perillos. Not no, too that's long a father ago. happy to see his daughter, but I'm surprised that his daughter would agree so readily to plant. Well, the she bug, she um, did use the you know because of our daughters. Think about the future generations of our our kids yeah. and the planet that we're going to leave behind for them. If we she does a lot do of this. manipulation in this episode, just like oh, Red. Yeah. Wonder where she learned it. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's it's not saying people- that he's her dad. He's just saying the father like figure taught her all this stuff that she needs to know. I was watching this uh, with my wife and she's like, ah, I can't, Liz is doing this. Liz is doing that. And every time she did that, I would throw in a moment where Red did the exact same thing in her past episode. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, <sighs> yeah, but I'm like, you can't, yeah, but that he did it. You can't sit there and say you're mad at her for doing the exact same thing. He's done a number of times, numerous times. Like you can't love him and hate her. For this, for the exact the same, same reasons, yeah, yeah, that just it doesn't play, doesn't play. Different set of standards, not fair. And I don't want to live in that world. Even though it was a clip, three cheers for seeing Eddie Kathagi back on the show. Oh man, I was really hoping he was going to pop back up. I was like, oh, I know they're bringing up back blacklisters this season. <laughs> Bring that one back. That'd that would be, be cool. That would be cool. He could work for Townsend. He could. Uh, Skip and Ezzy, they kind of help Liz orchestrate this, but that's about all they do. Really, I thought they would actually have a little bit more to do. In these up in this episode, but not so much. Um, Townsend 
most of his stuff we have seen the actions that he did, but now we kind of saw the motivations, I guess. And it was kind of it was kind of cool hearing his backstory of how the information leaked, and then people came after him and killed his family. So now we know why he's so angry about this, why he's so passionate about killing Reddington, because he believes he leaked the information that led to his family being murdered, correct? Well, I think he originally thought it was Katarina that leaked the information. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I'm saying, but that's and why then, he's after him now. Yeah. But, but but it was very interesting, this story about how uh, the kids were dying first, the wife had to watch, and then he had to watch his wife get killed in this house, and had, it was about his family. You know, if we go back to the pilot, Ronko Zamani was on a revenge path because of his family. And so then we get back to Diane Fowler telling Red about she knows what happened to his family. Mm-hmm. And then it's it, the, the the parallelisms are just enormous here. So it makes you really wonder what the hell does this all mean for whoever the hell Red is. I still say his family was murdered. It's possible. The Christmas, the Christmas story could be true when he was talking to Madeline Pratt. We just don't know. Could be. Could be. And I love his line. There's got to be no space between what you want and what you're willing to do to get it. Now, in this concept, in this context, not great. Because it's about killing a lot of people. But I think that's a great life mantra. Like, it really is a great life mantra. If you really, really, really want to do something, there can be no space between what you want and what you're willing to do to get it legally and ethically. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I, I kind of love that life mantra. It's a good mantra. Yeah, basically it's the do everything you can to succeed. Uh, what is it? If you strive for perfection, you'll never... At- You'll achieve excellence. Is that what it is? Yeah. If you strive for perfection, you'll achieve excellence. Because nobody's ever perfect, but you can definitely be damn good. Speak for yourself. All right. And speaking of perfection, makes a play play for it, ends up bloody on the floor. Do you think she's savable or dead? Did you see the amount of blood on the floor? It's a light light carpet. It spreads. She hit the table and the table shattered. Like she's gone. It is a head wound. If she even survives, she's in a coma at best, or she's not the Anne that we knew before. She's a vegetable. I didn't say that. I'm trying to have some positivity and some hope here. Well, do you think, do you, so you think she dies? You think that's it? I think she dies. And then okay. I think there's a mutual coming together between the, the two warring factions. You've lost something. I've lost something. Let's go ahead and finally put this thing to bed. <laughs> they West Side Story it and they just do a dance off? Pretty much. I would love that. It'd be pretty fantastic. Yeah, we could get the the Blacklist Musical episode. <laughs> Every show gets one anymore. I don't know why. At some point in time. At some point in time. Who's ultimately responsible for her injury? Your opinion. Anne's responsible for her own injury. She's the one that made the play to get the gun out of the way. The minute she the minute she engages, she puts her own life in fate's hands at that point. It does feel more like an accident than uh, even a self-defense thing. It's just more like she's oh, yeah. trying to go for it. They were just tw- sure twirling around and spinning and dancing. And then all of a sudden you slip and the table just happened to be in the way. So it wasn't like Liz threw her into the table on purpose. Like she did with the, the big burly guy, you know, from a couple seasons ago in the hundredth episode. Right. You know, that's, that was purposeful. Like get the heck off of me, big giant man. Boom. Smash into the coffee table. Yeah. This I was will just say a, this was just a happenstance and it wouldn't have happened if Anne hadn't engaged. So I I think it's Anne's fault. I think they carefully scripted and shot that. So you can't really blame Liz or Red specifically. I mean, you can action wise that led to this moment, but when it actually happens, it's very much if Anne just would have sat sat there, she would have been fine. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The question is, is who's the bigger person? So if you look at it from that angle, you know, Liz blames Red for killing her mother, pseudo mother, whatever you want to call her. And then in this case is read the bigger person to say, I understand that you did not kill Anne, And here's why I can accept that you need to accept that. I didn't kill your mother. And that's how they have the conversation to figure out how to get past this thing. You think it'll work like that or it's going to work like now red's going to be vengeful for her. I guess I don't know. I mean, we know Megan's back on the show for the rest of the season. So was one, the hunter one's the huntress. And they're just going to always go back and forth against each other. Or are we actually going to see them together again in like two episodes? I hope not. Yeah. That's way too much to overcome, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe there's a, you know, 
at some point Townsend's even like, like, why the hell should I trust you? And then Liz and Townsend are on the same team. So at some point you got to have a heart to heart and say, you know, fine. All the cards are on the table. Here's what's going on. And maybe that's it. Maybe we finally get some kind of reveal because in order for them to work together, the reveal has to finally come. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, so a red broken dream. Yeah. Red comes back. Hands laying dying on the floor in this moment after that whole thing. But he definitely loves her because he doesn't even care. This is a, a moment, a thing I noticed. I'm if it was any of the other writers, I probably would have been like, oh, it's probably just, you know, just how they wanted to write it. But I really think it was intentional to show how much he cared about Anne because he doesn't even look up to Liz at that moment. He only cares about Anne. He doesn't even care that Liz is there anymore and immediately calls 911 that's a completely selfless move because he knows the cops are coming. They're going to be coming for him. I don't know if he's going to leave before they get there or what, but he's sitting there holding her. He doesn't look up to Liz. He doesn't even think about Liz. He doesn't even try to get to her. He's just only thinking about Anne. So what did you think about that? I felt like it was very intentional. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that he knew that there was a gun to his head. He knew that he could die in any moment. And I think he was at that point where he was like, this is finally done. You know, I, I found a port. I found a home. I'm I'm just the fact that I lost that yet again for this stupid quest. Like it's finally time to end the quest. And uh, hopefully that's the way the season goes here on out is that it's time to end the quest end the 30 year plan, whatever the hell it's been, because <laughs> the stakes have finally gotten to a point where the stakes are too much. You're starting to sound bitter. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I just want new stories, <laughs> new stuff. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Um, okay, so we come to the camp. We kind of talked about Kaplan, but Liz is having this mental break where she's seeing Kaplan throughout it as her conscience or however you want to word it. And I, and I, like I said, I love that they work this in. Would you want this to continue or do you do you feel like this episode, it worked, let's not keep doing it? I mean, selfishly, right? Susan, fan of the show, love her to death. Mm-hmm. Love to see her as much stuff as we can, especially if she's not being a judge because she's normally a judge on most other stuff she's done. So if Liz wants to have conversations with Susan and she's back on the show for the rest of the season, I'm all for it. I think it's really cool to see like if, if she's supposed to be an FBI profiler and understand how the mind works of these criminals, why not see inside the mind of a profiling slash criminal because she is a criminal. Mm-hmm. I, love I dig it. it. I dig it. I, I'm same mind. I would love to see her back because to me, this was one of those things where I'm like, how are they going to, once I knew it was coming, NBC, uh, <laughs> all all I could think about was how are they going to do this and, and not cheapen her death? Like, just don't cheapen her death because I really loved her whole arc that season. Oh, yeah. And how she went out and it just she left on her own terms. I'm like, don't cheapen that. Like, that was so powerful, I thought, for that character. And they did a wonderful job. Like, the, this, I was really worried about this. I'm like, you know what You know what I hate? I hate dream sequences. Hate them. Can't stand them. So I'm like, please don't just be one long-ass dream sequence. And it wasn't. It, initially, I thought it was. Because the first time you meet her, I'm like, oh, she's a figment of her imagination. It's a dream. Okay, cool. And, you know, I'm rolling my eyes. But then as it went on, I'm like, oh, no. They're playing this as the voice in the head, the conscious, the, the, the voice propelling you forward, telling you what you need to do. Loved it. I would love to see that continue. And and I like to see inside Liz's head what she's thinking, you know, and maybe that'll help fans that are against her because she's against Red come back to her side a little bit when they see a little bit more of her internal dialogue. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Demi kind of plays that conscience for Red. So why not have a conscience, you know, confidant for Liz at the same yeah, time? Yeah, because wrestler doesn't get it done. No. Well, he does. He just does it a different way. Kaplan's better. Because she's like, you're going to have to kill him. <laughs> going to have to kill him, dearie. Take him out. All right. Well, we also meet uh, Mrs. French, who was married to Mr. French. And that was his her, her mom's contact. And he told Liz he'd help. And then he left. And she got there or was escorted out of there somehow and apparently is dead. Keep in mind, we never saw him. We're only hearing that from this lady. That says she was married to him. Where she could be Mr. French and you wouldn't even know. Yeah. Uh, according to your theories, sure. Um, 
what what do you what do you think about Mrs. French here? Because she's already the new nanny. I mean, that went really fast. Are I've you never, shocked? I've never seen I'm a, like, a, I, I a screener sh- program this this quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, oh, this is how this works in the blacklist. One uh, one one invitation, one invite, one interview, and boom, instant caregiver for Agnes. And I will tell you for the people that are rolling your eyes and throwing tantrums about this, uh, would you rather have Agnes in every episode? No, you don't. So it's okay. Just just let it happen. <laughs> yeah. Don't Not, nothing wrong with the actors. I'm just saying you don't want kids in every episode. You don't want to have to deal with kid. You don't want full house in your blacklist. Yeah. Mom, I'm tired. Can I go home now? No, shut up. <laughs> Read me a story. There's important right. stuff happening here. People need to know. Uh, speaking of story, tell me the the phantom toll booth because she's she's going to read this to agnes or she's reading this to agnes tell people what that story is yeah it's a children's fantasy adventure novel written by norton juster with illustrations by jules pfeiffer published back in 61 it tells the story of a bored young boy named milo who unexpectedly receives a magic toll booth one afternoon and having nothing better to do he literally drives his toy car through the toll booth transporting him into the kingdom of wisdom once prosperous but now in a troubled state there he acquires two faithful companions, a dog named Tok and the Humbug, and then goes on a quest to basically restore the kingdom, its exiled princess named Rhyme and Reason hmm. from the castle in the air. Uh, in this process, he actually learns valuable lessons, finding a love of learning. The text is full of puns and wordplay, such as when Milo unintentionally jumps to conclusions in Island in Wisdom, thus exploring the literal meanings of idioms, which very much sounds like someone named Raymond Reddington. He's got Kaplan. He's got Dembe. He's all full of like whimsical stories and rhymes and reasons and all this stuff. And he's trying to save the exiled princess in his, in Liz Keen and basically jumps to conclusions and finds a love interest in Anne. And so lots of, lots of similar, similar things going on in here with the story. So what do you think about Mr. French do you, or Mrs. French? I'm sorry. Do you think, think she's, she's okay. evil or? Nah, she's fine. Good. She's fine. I think she's fine. Huh? You don't think maybe she is the French that she was looking for? Kind of like a Mr. Kaplan? I, st- I, that's, that's my going in theory. I was like, oh, like you said, call and meet him here. And then she knocks the door. It's like, oh, my husband's gone. Like, I can't find him. It disappeared. Makes up a story that was like just plausible enough. Kind of like the water and power guy mm-hmm. from Kansas. You know? Which they made sure to say again in this episode to sure remind did. you. Yep. Sure did. So I think I think Mrs. French is Mr. French. Yep. So do I. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry that Liz can't find a capable nanny who isn't a criminal. All right. Well, we worked through Liz's plan here. We're gonna we're gonna zip through a couple of these, but uh the freelancer plans to free free him and and use him to manipulate chemical Mary. And then that's how she gets the Townsend. We already knew all that stuff, but now we see kind of the flip side of it. And then we see Mary's murder, which Liz does sanction. She is complicit. We already kind of knew that, but I do feel like it hits you a little bit more when you see it. Yeah. Because it, it she is struggling with it. Because she peeped in the sink. Yeah. So is she as dirty as red now in your uh, book? Well, but I, she already was. I mean, she literally stew a guy in a heart tub time machine. <laughs> Okay, uh, here's a fun part. We we get throughout this episode, we get numerous aspects of of Liz's humanity and her fractured psyche. Like she's talking to herself a lot, and she's doing things that are, are pushing her mind into harder places. And at the end, I think she comes out of it a little bit. Do you empathize with? Now you said by the end of this episode you were Team Liz. You would kind of switch sides. Which tells to, tells me you're now empathizing with her. So what turned you, I guess, from this episode? I think the fact that she needed to get things done using the tactics that Reddington would choose. The fact that she was all up in Townsend's grill about, well, you you let him escape on your dime. Like I had nothing to do with this. So she's very much of the Reddington mindset. But at the same time, she understands that there is a process. That she gets the flash drive to Cooper. You know, there is something to be said there to find her, you know, way home, her island, if you will, in wrestler, um, because she does go and actually sit in the car. It's not like Essie just making sure he's there. So that was cool to see. Um, And then I think at the end of the day, because she puked in the sink, you know, she doesn't want to murder people. It's not like this is her choice. She's been forced 
to make these choices by the situation. It's not who she truly is. And then because she doesn't pull the trigger at the end of the episode and flees, that's like her grabbing onto her sense of what's left of her humanity because she wants to keep that last fragment because she doesn't want to be the Mexican cave fish at the end of the day. Mm. Okay. Well, I was already teamless, so I didn't change anything. Right. And I think I've explained it uh, numerous times. Nobody wants to hear me talk about that again. Got that right. Wow. Well, <laughs> if you had lips, you could kiss my ass too. You know, if Liz t- talks about her scar and lies and tells people that she got it when she was 14 and Kaplan also said the scar was the key to her future. Now, this is an important part by her saying that she lies to people and tells them that she got it when she was 14. Explain to people why. Because in the pilot episode, when Liz is talking to Reddington, she tells Reddington the story that she got the scar from her father when she was 14 years old. Now, many people have said, oh, it's just the pilot, you know, because in the pilot they write it and then they change stuff later. And it was just one of those pilot rewrite mishaps. Other people, one actually being the guy that wrote the book, um, the uh, the inside to the blacklist that we did the interview for, mm-hmm. um, he actually surmised that, well, why would she tell a criminal the truth about her and actually hid that from him? And it's a very easy way to do it. Just make up a, a little bit of a fib, even though, yes, she got it from her father, but it wasn't when she was 14. It was when she was four years old because later in that episode, if you remember, she says that she got it in a fire when she was a little girl, the same age as I think it was Beth was the general's daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Cause my name is Liz. My name is Elizabeth too. Um, And so that's how you knew that she got it when she was a little girl. Cause she was the same age as Beth, not 14. So the fact that they wrote this in here, I think is very clever way to basically answer that question and put it to bed that it wasn't a pilot mix up. It was always intentional. It was Liz literally lying to red in order to cover up the truth. Just so she didn't show all of her cards from the beginning. Not cards or game reference. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay. Well, Liz willingly uses Dembe's info to bring Anne into the fold. Townsend of course takes it too far, but that's Liz's partner. Was it too far? Because Liz really gets that whole ball rolling, like the whole ball rolling. That's the one thing that I was really surprised about. I figured Townsend just found, you know, he's the one that found it. But Liz brought him to Cottonwood Falls. Oh, yeah. What'd you think? Like, that was, that was, that was nuts. That was Liz finally saying, like, Townsend's not in for, in it to win because he allowed Reddington to escape from Perillos. So now she had to basically come up with another plan. And this was the plan that she came up with. Like, find the thing that he loves the most, which was Dembe. And then found out, oh, he doesn't love Dembe as much as he loves this other lady. So let's use the other lady in order to get to him. I think it was brilliant, brilliant idea and deduction on her part. But was she it was too actually far? profiling people for a change. Sure. Was it too far though? To bring Anne into it? Or to, to bring Dembe to bring into towns it? into Cottonwood Falls. Knowing how he was, knowing how there's no space, you know, it was it too far. Because basically Liz, former law enforcement officer, Essentially got a couple cops killed, three cops killed. Well, and, and Kaplan and her struggle with that conversation, right? You, you, you can't go there and you can't, you know, innocent people are going to die. And she's like even yelling at him on the phone. Hey, you got to turn around. Innocent people are going to die. So she understands that innocent people are going to die, but she also has to understand who she involved to begin with. Right. So, so I'm saying did she go too far by telling him instead of pursuing that angle herself alone. You know what I mean? Like, by bringing Townsend into Cottonwood Falls, did Liz go too far with that, or she didn't really go much further than she already had? I don't think she went much further than she already did, because she was already in bed with Townsend at that point. If this would have been the first incursion with Townsend, then maybe. But since he already did the stuff with Rudiger and with Dembe and Perlos, she already knows what's up. She knows that Rudiger got the crap beat out of him in a punching bag. So, no, she's like, I understand. There can be no... No gray area. It has to be all in or not in at all. And so she was like, okay, fine. I got to tell him this is where we can get him. Now, I just want to reiterate, you know, Anne is hurt. Everybody will blame Liz. I already said that once before. But I just want to remember, remind you that Dembe warned Red not to see Anne. Mm -hmm. Liz warned Red, tell me, tell me, tell me, over and over and over again. Red never listens. A little bit selfish. I think the question of who's really at fault is a little more complicated than just it's Liz's fault, even though 
Troy explained very eloquently that it's really Anne's fault because she's not a ninja. But we'll see what the fans think with our profiling question next week. Absolutely. So last question, what do you think will happen from here versus what should, what you think should happen? Like, what do or I want from like the rest to, of like the to season? like to see happen, I should say. Um, well, yeah, from here on out. Like, do you, here, because here's the thing. It can go one of two ways. It can go either they're still having a war or they come together to go against Townsend and they'll figure it out when it's done or there's still going to be on opposite sides or, how, you know, what do you think is going to happen? I think in order for Liz to go against Townsend, something bad has to happen to Liz first. So maybe Agnes is in trouble. Maybe wrestlers in trouble. Something has to basically tip it so that Liz needs red to help her save something from going down with Townsend. And that's how they get Townsend. Maybe like episode 19, maybe episode 20, because that would be like the end of the Townsend thing. So they can then set up the season finale into next season. Yeah. I want them to still be at odds all the time. I don't want her. The last thing I want is for Liz to need Red's help at some point. I just feel like that would kind of take away from all the character development that they've got this season for her. You know what that's I mean? the only way they can get back to the two nah, of them together. Otherwise, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think Red can finally come to his senses and actually say, you know, basically, all right, we'll talk. I will tell you everything you want to know, but we have to get Townsend first. We have to take care of this first. And he has to put something to bet. Like he has to either acknowledge that he killed her mom or acknowledge that it wasn't her mom or acknowledge that she is her mom, but she really wasn't as lovingly as you might recall kind of thing. But how can she believe him? It's a, it's a good question. I don't know. But, but I think I just don't want them to, I just don't want them all lovey dovey again. So quick. I just, I don't think it'll work. And I don't want that. I don't want her to need anything from him. That's the biggest thing. I think that will completely ruin the character progress that we've had for Liz in terms of making her this very resilient um, underworld figure. Like she's, she's learning the system. She's building her own network. She's doing all of these things. If then she has to turn to red, the one guy she's so mad at and ask him for help. I, I would prefer that red needs her help with something. I think that would be more of an interesting turn and it would feel more like, all right, all right. I like, I can work with this. That That's what I would prefer. And maybe that's what happens. Maybe Red is going to blame Townsend for even showing up in Kansas to begin with for Anne's death. And therefore, he's willing to actually open the archive and tell Liz, hey, this is everything you need to know. And this is why Townsend is bad. And that's why I need your help to go get him. Because now you're on the inside and I need you. Right. That could work. I'm just curious how the friend in the East is going to play into all this. And then when you think about Townsend's family and how they were part of this Russian mob network of ports or whatever and got exposed. Are they anywhere related to this group of friends that Red has in Russia currently? Is it the same cartel, if you will? We'll find out. We, we've talked, uh, you know, 50 minutes about a recap clip show. So we want to take a second <laughs> to say thank you to those of you that are supporting the show by going to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash the blacklist GSM. Special big thanks to our honorary blacklister, Patricia. Also, a special shout out to our task force members, Judy and Sharon, Rory, Karen, Bobby Jens, and now Mary, all official task force members. All of these people receive very cool gifts from us, and you can get a cool gift as well for donating at the $20 level or higher. If you want a cool t-shirt or a coffee mug, you don't have to stay at the $20 level forever, just a few months to get the cool gifts. And as you know, if you are at the $5 level, you get the podcast on Friday night before everybody else in the world. So just go ahead and keep on tipping away. Put your five bucks in the fedora over at P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That's patreon.com slash the blacklist G-S-M. Go ahead and put your money in the app. Even if you just give us two bucks, one for Aaron and one for me, we are actually really, really close to turning this into a video podcast, maybe even yet this year. Because if we hit the $500 a month goal, then remember, we do this on video for all of you to see our ugly mugs, which is probably scarier than you really want to see. But if, if you do it quickly, we can get there before season nine. And if you hit $512, I do it shirtless. I'm just mm. saying. I'm just saying. I didn't nope. say on camera. I'm just going to be doing it shirtless. Well, stay tuned. We got much more show coming up right after this. 
You obviously love podcasts, but are you also a fan of movies and television? Do you want to listen to a show that reviews entertainment honestly and casts pretentiousness to the wind? That debates both film and TV topics in a fun, good-spirited way, while still getting to the heart of why we all love them so much? Then don't miss the award-winning weekly podcast, The Hollywood Outsider. Now available on your favorite podcast app or at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Hello, Garys. This is Susan Blummert, but my fans call me Mr. Kaplan. You're listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. Okay, we've got some special agent intel. That means we've got emails and comments from y'all. From the mailbag, C. Canterbury says, Your podcast is so entertaining. Thank you. I have been recommending it to all Blacklist watching friends. I am 100% Team Liz. I like you. I like you a lot. Uh, Red is selfish, as Ann said. <laughs> that moment made me Team Liz forever. Or, I'm sorry, the moment that made me Team Liz forever is when Tom and Liz are in the back of the car. Tom is dying. <laughs> and Liz is close to death due to the Ian Garvey attack. And Debbie asks Red why he can't just be honest and give Liz the answer she is looking for. Red replies, I don't know. People are dying, but Red doesn't know why he can't give Liz answers. So yes, this one is easy. Team Liz. Looking forward to hearing from each of you which team you are on and why. Team Liz. And both of you, as both of you said, last two episodes have been amazing. The casting has been excellent this entire season. The actors who play Anne, Rakitin, Essie, and Skip have all been a treat to watch. I am looking forward to the return of Liz Keen. And like Liz, I'm hoping for some answers. I agree with everything you said. And that's mostly why I am Team Liz. Because I have said for a long time, Red should have just told her by now. It's really on him. But the one thing you didn't do was tell all of your blacklist enemies to listen to the podcast also, as Aaron tells you every single week. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for the email. It was great. Yeah, it was Appreciate great email. Um, our good buddy James Steen said, Aaron, Troy, let's look back at Rakitin a little bit. I believe that Agent Park is going to have some explaining to do once Panabaker does her investigation into his death. It's obvious they are going to conclude that she was the last person to enter the room after viewing the video and listening to the recording. Yep. They will know about the envelope, a piece of paper. Cooper has already warned her about her uncontrollable temper. You would have to assume there is any room in the facility that would be under surveillance, even though the room that she burnt the envelope. What do you all think about that if it's not brought up this week? I am sure that is a future episode plot that will be happening shortly. Yeah, I don't think they're going to let that one go. Um, I feel like it's painfully obvious who got to him. So if they are going to be an elite FBI force, I would think they would think about her (laughs) for sure. (laughs) Yes. So it better come up. It better come up. Like if it doesn't come up, I'll kind of be disappointed because I don't, I don't know how you let that skate. And also, I mean, everybody on the, on the task force is basically a murderer. I think at this point. Yep. All right. Well, he continues about Anne last week. He said a couple of questions. What happened to the person that was supposed to follow Anne home? I'm like, Good question. She did say First, I wanted some space and some time. So maybe he's coming a little bit later. Oh, the, uh, the cops, the cops, oh, the FBI. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, did red have somebody? I don't, I didn't remember that. Okay. So you're talking about the police. Well, they said the next day or something like that. There a couple hours. She wanted couple to sleep. Hours. Yeah. So it was supposed to be a couple hours. I still say James, the media and the FBI would still be swarming all over that place, but it's TV. We just got to let it go. You're right though. Uh, How did Townsend know where Red was? You got your answer this week. It's all about Liz. The more you know. That's another NBC thing. I like that one, though. Now, how did Townsend get away from the FBI, especially SWAT or SERG units? That's a great question. But if you remember from from the Ann episode, Townsend was long gone before the FBI actually got on the scene. Mm -hmm. So that's how he was able to get away. Yep. Although I don't know if Cottonwood Falls is a big town. They would have seen him leaving it from one direction of the four-way stop sign downtown, probably. Um, have either of you both had a dream that seems real after you woke up that you thought was real? It's just my guess that Liz was dreaming though. She was talking to Mr. Kaplan. I believe that was a real shoot when Mr. Kaplan is putting her hand on Lizzie's face in the picture. So we have seen pictures of her laying in the bed and then sitting up, but she was still asleep and you are correct. Mr. Steen based on this week's episode. And have I had a dream that was seems so real after, and then I woke up and I still thought it was real. Sure. Sure. 
That's that's always the go to excuse when the police question me. I, I've actually. <laughs> It was a dream. I woke up. I didn't mean to do it. My bad. <laughs> well, I, I'll have the I'll have the deeper conversation in the sense oh, that um, the, this month actually I've had two pretty good friends pass away unexpectedly, and so I've been contemplating death quite a bit. And I I found that as I've gotten older, when I get up in the morning, I've kind of I think lost time because I think it's literally a different day than it than it really actually is. Like I've been sleeping so much deeper. That instead of like waking up this morning and thinking it was you know Friday, I woke up and thought it was Sunday. Like I, it's, mm. it's weird. I don't know what that's all about, but I've been doing that a lot lately. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping. Kinda. <laughs> I mostly just wake up and go, "Ow!" I remember when that didn't hurt. <laughs> that too. <laughs> pretty much how I do. That too. All right. Thank you for the email, Sharon Crady. I thought episode eight thirteen, which was last week, was a great standalone episode. That last scene, Elizabeth is pointing the gun at Red, but you can tell that Anne is very frightened. Liz cannot kill Anne. It would be un- inexcusable, even for those who are Team Liz. Well, I am Team Liz, and I am telling you, Anne ain't Chuck Norris. I don't know what she was thinking. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not hating Liz for this one. Again, Red brought her into the fold. Should she have been there? No. Should this have happened? No. Should Red have come back? No. No. I'm mad at everybody. I think everybody led to this poor woman's death. Mostly, I think it's Anne's fault. I think they actually did a very good job of setting it up, so it's hard to just blame Liz for it. Correct. 100%. Um, right. Well, Carell came and said, ideas from Anne. Uh, Red is capable of both incredible sacrifice and staggering selfishness. Anne shows that you can call out Red for being selfish yet still like him. Sure. Fans might want to take note. <laughs> Glad that Liz is coming back. Is that because they, they lash out that I don't like Red because I say he's selfish? And I'm like, he's a he's a master criminal. Yeah, yeah, he's selfish. I'm sorry if you don't think so, but he is. Uh, Glad that Liz is coming back. Also, thanks for this podcast. It's basically the only place where I can engage with Blacklist fan community as everywhere else is just full of ridiculousness. Unthinking hate for Liz specifically. Agreed. Uh, the avoid patterns thinking is nothing new, but it escapes me how is going five times to Ann a pattern and constantly visiting post office and Red's restaurant not a pattern. How did Townsend not bound the restaurant by now? I thought that, of that too. Really good That's question. Great question. Great question. But I, I, it seems to be them saying a pattern because he's going at the same time, maybe, where post office is very random. So, you know, that could be a little easier less of a pattern than but the restaurant the restaurant he's been there quite a bit yeah that's probably true i'm just trying to make excuses i don't know plus park and rakeaton know where the restaurant is i don't know at this point why doesn't every criminal know that he's informing on them that's what i want to know because at some point all these criminals may be meeting in the criminal mess hall or something and they're like ah so you knew red and you're here all 12 of us worked with red and we're all here he all saw us basically right before we ended up getting arrested. Shit. You know what I mean? So And then and then if uh, Red's able to get messages from prison to the outside, don't you think those guys can get messages to the outside? I, I would think so. <laughs> and somebody's going to ask, who was the last guy you talked to? Uh, it was the guy with the hat. Yeah, it was that guy. Oh, yeah. Remember him or her if you're Troy. Um, <laughs> Happy to see Townsend <laughs> in the field. All of his previous appearances portrayed him as recluse and kind of uh, in sense. So he's taken charge in the field, made him feel as more of a threat. His willingness to put himself in harm's way because of his hatred for red might also be his undoing, which is great to get an explanation as to why he was taking the pills and seemed like he was not so with it. And it's because he literally can't sleep because he feels like if he were to go to sleep, something bad is going to happen because he was sleeping while his family was murdered. Yeah, so I really get that answer. It was really good. I like that backstory a lot. And I think they they did a really, I guess we didn't talk about that earlier. The one thing I will say they did really, really, they did several really cool things here, but they gave Townsend more of a presence, a presence of, of a, a real story, a background instead of a caricature. Cause I do yeah. feel like he's been kind of a caricature for this season. Well, you so, mean just tying up people, using them as a punching bag. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> now we've get some, some, some there's some juice to, to the squeeze now, yeah. you know? So 
and you almost kind of feel bad for him. Like he's just a, another guy being just like red, you know, my family was gone and therefore this is what I've been left with was try to find an answer and doing it everything I sure. can to get that answer. Uh, Lacey Ann Nelson, Troy and Aaron. I want to add my five cents worth of observation. Well, you can add $5 at Patreon. If you'd like this, <laughs> this end of season eight, 13, everyone seems to be transfixed on Meg Boone's return to series. There's so many ominous end game and demise of main characters. Maybe Spader is planning early departure from the show. I'm in agreement with you both. Red and Anne canoodling their way into the sunset suits me fine. But this is the blacklist. I need your opinion. Kissing scene number two was Anne checking for the gun. Her backhand, waistband of the pants, or putting a transponder tracker on his belt. No, I think they were just making out. Yeah. After you see this week's episode, that would be the correct answer. Last week, I mean, yeah, you could think, like, is Anne still a plant? Is Anne still something? Who should be doing something? But I didn't. I think they were truly in love. Yeah, and and the whole being transfixed with her return to series, like I, you know, I the only thing I do wish is that maybe maybe NBC should have put out like a press release just to to curt the the fans' fervor a little bit, just to bring it down, dial it down a little bit, because I so many people were like, "Well, is she coming back? Is she not coming back?" I'm like, yeah, she's coming back. I mean, you know, she's Liz is still a, a factor. So, but I I don't know. I don't really know what the right answer to that is. I just know thinking that we're entitled to know an, um, an actor's personal life is wrong. It's yeah. none of our business. Like we shouldn't expect an answer. Nope. But at the same time by NBC, not giving an answer, you cause like a media storm and then you cause a medium storm of ill intent in a lot of the ways. And that ill intent is something that Megan may or may not be able to come back from personally herself because people are going to form opinion based on misinformation. That's possible. I mean, I'm hoping that she's back for a couple episodes and it, you know, it'll all subside. It usually does. That's how yeah. these things are. It was great to see her back this week. Loved I was it. so happy. I was on cloud. And I'm like, thank God. Thank God. Cause I, I miss her on the show. I'm sorry. I just, I think she's great. I think, well, I'm not sorry. I don't even know why I said that. I think she's great on the show. Yeah. she's good. Sometimes the character's not written fantastic, but I also think, they're trying to drag it out and try and make it stretch, stretch out, and they have to keep the mystery going for the relationship, and that's that's a factor. That's it's more an issue of writing than it is actors. Sometimes. Acting, correct. Uh, Terry Todd said, "I've been doing some thinking. That never goes well, Terry. Just to let you know. Um, that's why I don't even try. And I've been going be very upset if it turns out that Liz orchestrated this whole thing with Anne, made friends with her, and then used her as bait, throwing her out there and luring Red in." Maybe with Anne not even being in on it and knowing what was happening. If so, she took a gamble because she didn't know for sure that Red would bite. But he approached Anne and developed the friendship Liz would hope happened. Then she just sits back and watches and waits for her opportunity to snag Red. Well, we know that's not the case. Anne and and uh, Red were literally um, platonic and just met happenstance in, in, in the park over some birds. Um, but then she does end up using Anne in order to get to red in the end. Uh, it's perfectly a good red move if it turns out to be the case, which didn't. She's trying to outsmart red at every turn, although she did most of that for the rest of the episode. Uh, even though it makes me angry that she would play red with emotions like that, I got to give her credit. Between what Sam taught her and what red taught her, plus the life experiences she's had personally, all the trauma and hard knocks she's endured in her job with Tom and Toad. Oh, Tom the Toad. That's even better. That's a new <laughs> nickname for him. I like that one. <laughs> Tom the Toad. Tom the Toad. No, dead Tom forever. Uh, she's developed into a formidable adversary for Red. He's going to have to really get his game to compete with Liz. Unfortunately for him, he will never bring himself to kill her. I just hope this feud ends before she succeeds in her plan to kill him. Uh, it's renewed for season nine, so she's not going to succeed this year in killing him. No. No. Not to say that can she might not die at the end of the season, but who knows? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, who's this? Dino? DinoCharter.net. Dino? Okay. On YouTube from last week. Damn you, Blacklist writers. Why must you play with my emotions like that? I'll never listen to Angel of the Morning the same again. Fantastic episode, by the way. Well, people, guess what? After this week's episode, them. you're never going to listen to it the same way. <laughs> Because it was playing again as she slowly passes away in Red's arms. Yep. Potentially. Oh. Uh, Curly Collie on YouTube said, pretty sure Red is lying about this whole bridge stuff. Uh, apparently he plays bridge pretty well, at least in season three, episode 10. The director conclusion. Intercede. Red laughs. 
Oh my God, this is why I'm a terrible bridge player. With anyone else, Steve Lidditt would have won the North American pairs. We didn't even make it through regionals. I abhor working with a partner. Sharing my hand with anyone goes against every instinct I have. But such is life. Here we are. Cooper says, well, what the hell do you have in mind? And Red says, see, this is why I don't play well with partners. Don't fret, Harold. I'm holding all the trumps. I'll be the declarer. You be the dummy and we'll win the hand. Anything else? Good. Let's begin. So he knows more about bridge in season three than he does in season eight. Maybe he forgot. The illness got to it. Is that what we're saying? Easy like, rider. No. Way, easy rider way out of it. You know what? I haven't played spades in forever or hearts in forever. So I wouldn't remember how to play when I sat down. So could just be they forgot they wrote that. <laughs> it's possible. It could happen. But in hearts, is it not a misere hand because you're trying not to get the hearts? I think you didn't hear me when I just said, I haven't played in a while, so I don't remember how to play. <laughs> I literally just said that. You really don't listen to me. Uh, Bru- I can't say it. Brunji Halima on YouTube said, you guys remember in season one, it was revealed that Red's back is heavily burnt and scarred. Wouldn't Anne have asked him or something since you know she saw him naked? Um, probably. Some people wear t-shirts to bed. <laughs> Turn the lights off? Yeah. Because they were humping? <laughs> Maybe. I'm, I'm cold when I have sex, you know? But but the, wouldn't they have a- a- asked it in bed when she's like, oh, you're all burnt up? Hmm. What's that from? And they don't have to show us that because they're not, they didn't show the sex. So that's right. It's called convenient television. Yep. Well, finally, the big winner of the evening is Teresa, who sent in this well before the Misere episode aired. She says, when Anne said she was with her neighbor, Cindy, who has a cabin in the woods, it made me remember a few episodes ago when Liz was staying in a motel registered as Cynthia Rutherford and Mm -hmm. wrestler commented that it was one of her aliases. Do you think that neighbor Cindy is really Liz using her alias? She does have a cabin in Alaska. Thanks. Love your podcast. Well done. That's that's not for that's not for Tom. That's for you. Well done, Teresa. Kudos. The fact that you got that well before the episode aired means either you work on the show <laughs> or <laughs> you are very astute because I did not put that together at all. I that did not put that together. Cindy and Cynthia I would not put together as two the same name, even though it technically is very smart like very sharp very astute seriously uh, Teresa, you, you want to do a spot podcast you want to take podcast. a spot yeah <laughs> come on over <laughs> all right well, uh, well that's we, it. Need to, we need to put her and um uh who was it uh curly collie they're the new hosts for getting the season three episode 10 bridge reference there you go bam you guys can just tear it apart <laughs> bring it down just make sure to applaud every time you, anybody mentions Tom. That, just do exactly. that exactly just do that that's all i ask and call Troy a dum-dum from time to time. All right, well, that will conclude this discussion. Now is the time to recommend the Blacklist to your friend, your enemy, or your neighbor. And when you do, please also recommend that they listen and subscribe to the Blacklist Exposed podcast. All the case profiles can be found at theblacklistexposed.com and everywhere else great podcasts can be heard. And also, I did get, I don't remember who sent it direct to me, but they sent me a message saying, hey, the, the dead time thing is old. It's not funny anymore. And I disagree. Always funny. Every time I got five, five more of those that said it's the greatest thing they've ever heard <laughs> since we did like, I don't remember what we said. Oh, Troy's question. That was what it was. Oh, yeah. Troy's question. question. <laughs> For more great Aaron and Troy hijinks, follow us on your favorite social media outlet. I'm at Troy Heinrichs. He's at Aaron Smirks. And together we are at the Blacklist GSM. Talk about the show, the podcast, or your favorite card game, because it just seems to be the thing we're talking about these days. <laughs> Big thanks for listening. Don't forget to answer our profiling question. Who's really to blame for Anne's injury? Because we don't know if she's dead or not. Red or Liz? Neither. <laughs> well, you've already answered it. You got team Anne. We're not having Anne in the mix. But in terms of those two, who do you feel is more responsible? What percentage do you give? You know? Yeah. Who, if, you, if you're averaging up, which of those two are you leaning more toward as responsible? That's going to do it. We're done. I have no idea... How we talked over an hour about an episode that was a recap show. They did a recap show for 42 minutes, so I guess it works. <laughs> Damn it, when you're right, you're right. But also, very happy Liz was back. That was fun. I can't wait to see. Now we can finally go forward and see where this is all going to take us. So thanks, everybody, for listening. All right, take care. 
Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right. We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at 5popcorn. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts. Eight episodes to answers. Cross your fingers, everybody. <laughs> how many how many seasons you said that? Uh, Every okay, single one. one about this exact same time. Exactly. Here are the bones. <laughs> What's in the shoe case? What'd you see, Tom? Oh, you died for nothing because she found that answer out like the next season anyway. Where's that rocking boat going? Where are the burns from? Where's the cat? Where's the stupid cat?